So it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Joshua Shannon uh, Chastain, um, our speaker this evening, or Queen and Sultan, Anglo-Ottoman advisors, soldiers, mercenaries and imperial agents in war and state, 1853 to 1890. It's always sort of surprised me how many um, foreigners uh, were involved uh, in the Ottoman state and in the Ottoman army. And uh, so I'm delighted that Joshua will, will talk to us uh, about one aspect of that. In terms of uh, Joshua's background, he is a program manager at the University of Maryland, uh, College Park. He did his undergraduate studies in history at Portland State University and completed his MA in history at Bilgi University in Istanbul. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's his part of his thesis that we'll be uh, hearing about, um, and for which he did extensive research in the National Archives here in the UK and in the Ottoman State Archives um, on Anglo Ottoman military officers. Um, he's presented his research um, at various universities, including New Delhi and Berlin, and he's currently currently in Southern California, uh, supporting his wife in her doctoral program in Ottoman Armenian history. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you'd like to pass control to Joshua, Craig. Okay, Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, a million years ago, but I think eight years ago, 2014, I attended a um, event uh, at the British consulate in Istanbul in 2014, which was um, a great presentation and a great time to be at Istanbul. I dearly miss Istanbul, so any of you who are still there, um, I'm, I'm always happy to hear news. Um, all right, uh, two quick notes. Um, we are experiencing a heat wave, um, so it is not air conditioning. So if I start profusely sweating, I assure you it is not your questions. It is just that it is really hot. Um, so with that, let me dive in. On May 24, 19, oh, there we go, 1915, during a brief armistice, a 61-year-old, Australian colonel walked through the no man's lands of the Gallipoli battlefields, taking photos of the dead. Curious Ottoman onlookers observed that he was wearing a number of Ottoman war medals, and they quickly raged that this Australian had taken this brief time of peace to scavenge the dead and steal honors. Hearing this conversation, the Australian colonel turned to them and in Turkish said, these medals were given to me by Ghazi Osman Pasha for my service at the, at the siege of Helvna during the uh, Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-1878. Then apparently the Ottomans overcome, uh, kissed his hands and hugged him and uh, praised him for his Ottoman service. Uh, whether or not this story is tr true or apocryphal, the basic details of it are. The aforementioned Australian was a one Charles Snodgrass Ryan, a recently retired surgeon from Melbourne, who some 40 years earlier had served as a doctor in the Ottoman army during the siege of Pelvna and also in Erzurum and Kars. Uh, in addition to serving in the Ottoman army, he then became a consul, an Ottoman consul in Melbourne and ser served the Ottoman state uh, as a consular officer for many years. However, with the outbreak of World War I, he found himself on the opposite side of uh, an empire that he had long served. Uh, he wrote a key memoir from the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878, uh, that military historians to this day still rely upon. I am not a military historian. I'm actually interested in Ottoman social history 
and I got this project trying to learn more about the everyday Ottoman soldiers by using British sources who wrote about them. I ultimately did not find enough about day-to-day -day Ottoman soldiers to be able to uh, complete a thesis on that. So I ended up focusing more on the, uh, the British officers who wrote about them. It's worth taking a moment to think about the British discourse on the Ottoman Empire by the time we get to the late 19th and early 20th century. There's a long established canon of British historiography on the Ottoman Empire going all the way back to Paul Rekut, who during the 17th century was the Ottoman ambassador, was the uh, British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Now his work, uh, was read by um, later Ottoman travelers, such as uh, Lady Mary um, uh, Montague and uh, doctors like Alexander and Patrick Russell, who lived in Aleppo. They, in the 18th century, read and critiqued his own work. Lady Montague made the point that Rykut, uh, much more out state of um, the British English state and English Christianity than he was in fact observing about the Ottoman structures of power and religion. Likewise, um, her contemporary Alexander Russell read her own letters and concluded that her betrayals of the um, Ottoman baths in which she wrote about dancing girls and uh, sitting around drinking sherbet and listening to music for hours on end were certainly uh, fanciful as he, who had lived in Ottoman Syria for many decades and was and had uh, high ranking Ottoman female patients had heard that such tales were untrue. I am not here to uh, uh, to negotiate who is right and who is wrong, but more to make the point that for a long time, British authors have been reading uh, each other's works and critiquing them in a very modern way. The kind of uh, modern critiques we use today looking at, for example, issues of Orientalism, colonial knowledge, and the general biases that we know that foreign writers had in the Ottoman Empire existed during the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. There's a great deal of uh, literature that was produced by um, British travelers, officers, doctors, diplomats in the Ottoman Empire that's oftentimes overlooked because it's grouped together what we, with what we call travel literature, which has oftentimes rightly been criticized for its Orientalist inaccuracy. However, many of the uh, individuals I'm going to discuss today spent decades in the Ottoman Empire and were well, well aware at their audiences back in London held such what we call today Orientalist views. And they oftentimes had very open and public debates with one another about Ottoman and British policy in the press through pamphlets and newspapers, oftentimes actually publishing official documents in the very way we today as historians use documents to prove our case. They were taking contemporary documents to make their own arguments. So how does one become an officer in the Ottoman army in the 19th century? Well, the classic way was that of Omar Pasha, here you see pictured, who was the uh, Ottoman general during the Crimean War. However, he was not born in the Ottoman Empire. He was born in 1806 as Michael Lattis in a village in the Likia region bordering the Ottoman Empire in the Habsburg Empire. Young Mattis attended military school, learned German and Italian, and by 1827 was a sergeant in the Habsburg army. However, in 1827, he crossed the border after making some friends with some of the Muslim elite of Bosnia, learned Turkish, ch changed his name to Omar Lufti, and attended the Ottoman Military Academy. He was brought on as an instructor and made a subasha, and later became a tutor to Sultan Mahmud II, teaching the Sultan's son, 
Abdul, Abdul Majid. Clearly, strong imperial connections could not have hurt his future career, but it is also interesting to note that he made a point of staying away from uh, Europeans in Istanbul and rather associating himself with the Muslim elite and religious authorities. According to all sources, he fully embraced his Ottoman and Islamic identity and very much became Ottoman. The other way to serve in the Ottoman military was to be an advisor. And after the war for Greek independence uh, in 1928, one of the first to be an advisor to the Ottoman Empire was Adolphus Slade, uh, born in 1802 and educated at the Naval Portsmouth. Uh, Slade actually fought against the Ottomans in 1827 at the Battle of Navarro, but by 1829, he had changed and had a pro-Ottoman outlook and had become and became a advisor to the Ottoman Navy. He would spend, uh, he would spend the rest of his life from uh, 1829 until his death in 1877 living in Istanbul and by all accounts becoming quite other than he did not convert or keep a harem. However, he was, while he was clearly loyal to the Ottoman state, and in fact wrote uh, regular uh, newspaper editorials defending Ottoman foreign policy during both the Crimean War, but later especially during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878, when there were the so-called well, very real Bulgarian massacres. Uh, he was also a li liaison with British Admiralty and passed intelligence to them. Importantly, he was given the name uh, Mushvir Pasha, which quite literally translates to um, advisor or counselor Pasha. So you can see from the Ottoman perspective what they, how they considered him. Uh, and so there are these two paths. The first to basically become Ottoman, um, change your name, embrace Islam, and embrace Ottoman culture and society. Well, the other was uh, as a foreign military advisor. The role of foreign military advisor, advisors in the Ottoman Empire has not been widely studied, but it's something we would very much recognize uh, from our modern perspective. Now, the Ottomans had great need to modernize their army in the 19th century as they faced threats from Mehmet Ali in Egypt and obviously their continual wars against the Russian Empire. With the outbreak of the Crimean War, both France and Britain came to the aid of the Ottoman Empire, or perhaps came for their own uh, geopolitical reasons. But at the outset of the Crimean War, the British army found itself in a difficult place. The French army, uh, which numbered somewhere around 70,000 troops, had ex long experience uh, fighting in Algiers, whereas the British army uh, numbered somewhere around 13,000 men and was still very much dressed and commanded in the style of the Napoleonic Wars. This meant for the British to have any real uh, military influence during the Crimean War, they needed other forms of military recruitment. Uh, the British were involved with numerous endeavors to raise troops from Sardinia, from Polish regiments. But one of the most interesting uh, things they did was conclude a treaty with the Ottoman state, giving them 20,000 Ottoman soldiers to command which is called the Anglo-Turkish contingent, Turkish contingent, although to be clear, the Ottomans never called, uh, never used the word Turkish. The, the Ottomans called it contingent asker, basically military contingent. Now, interestingly, this uh, contingent of 20,000 Ottoman soldiers was to be commanded by British officers, but British officers from the Indian army. At this period of British history, and again, this is in 
1855, which is before the Great Mutiny of India and the reorganization of the uh, East India Company Army. Uh, military officer, British military officers in India were considered second class to their uh, to their cousins, formal British army. So for the Indian officers who served in the Turkish contingent, uh, they were motivated by two factors. One, it was an official position within the British army. And second, uh, as an incentive, they were uh, allowed to skip one rank. So whatever your rank had been by serving in the Turkish contingent, you were then instantly promoted. Their commander uh, was Major General John, sorry, Robert John Vivian of the Indian Army. Um, and a side note, I have a detailed background on many of these officers that I'm happy to talk about in Q&A, but I don't think I'm to outline uh, everyone's career before uh, entering the Ottoman Army. Um, but what's so interesting about the Turkish contingent was that it was staffed by uh, Indian officers. And Cade, um, who we previously mentioned, uh, was a keen observer of this. And he wrote that uh, the British expected the troops to be ready immediately for service. However, the Ottomans were rather reluctant to turn over the troops that they say had so recently promised. The British uh, imagined that they would raid and command these Ottoman troops as they did Indian sepoys. They talked of Istanbul as Calcutta and they thought of the Ottomans as Indians. Now this did not go over well with the Ottomans at all. And the initial uh, placement of the Turkish contingent near Istanbul was moved um, to, which I'm sure pronouncing wrong, Kritch, which as you can see on the um, Crimean Peninsula, was near the fighting, but well in the rear of it. Um, once there, the, the Indian officers began uh, mingling and training their new uh, Ottoman recruits. Now these Ottoman recruits were drawn from both uh, reservists and frontline Ottoman troops. These were not raw recruits. And many um, believed that this was intentional so that the British would not be able to, in a sense, mold a force that was loyal to them. Rather, they would be training and leading Ottoman troops who were already used to an Ottoman structure and chain of command. Um, however, um, there was a great deal of esprit de corps and in fact, goodwill established between these Ottoman troops and their British officers. This may have uh, been in part that British pay was regular and the rations were much better than, uh, their, uh, than they would have been in the Ottoman army. Um, but interestingly, the Turkish contingent was never deployed during the Crimean War. They spent the entire war in Kritch. Wait, this was to the consternation of British officials and officers who wanted them to be sent east to Kars, which was under siege from the Russian army, uh, and eventually a siege that will be lost by the combined British Ottoman forces. However, the Ottomans and Omar Pasha in particular were vehemently opposed to deploying the Turkish contingent. And it's worth um, thinking about why. Although we don't think about the Ottoman Empire oftentimes from the perspective of British colonial we might think of British India or later British Egypt during the same time. We must imagine that these Anglo-Indian officers who came from India and led a native army which controlled the vast territories of India may have thought that with the help of their new Turkish soldiers, they might be able to 
if not control the uh, Ottoman state, at least exert influence on it. Um, and after the war, Vivian actually made, wrote a number of, um, he wrote his own account, his rather a number of letters to um, British government officers making this point. Um, he said, uh, the sepoys have been improved under our command, but British rule has long been in India. The same effect may be produced in the Turks, but it can only be brought about in time. But he wrote, the Turkish contingent operated like a machine, a well-oiled machine uh, that in his opinion could be deployed to the benefit of the British and Ottoman state. What he meant by this was a suggestion from the uh, British ambassador, Sir uh, Stafford Radcliffe, uh, that the Turkish contingent be used by the Ottoman state uh, to enforce um, the Furman of 1856, which uh, gave great equality to all Ottoman subjects. Now, I think it's clear that the Ottomans themselves were not stupid and had no desire to allow themselves uh, to be influenced by an Ottoman army controlled by British officers. And as soon as the Crimean War ended, they were disbanded. Um, now, I spent many, many hours in the British archives going through thousands of documents of the Turkish contingent. And I have to say, really nothing happened. There was no conflicts, no records of court martials, just day-to-day ages -day training. Um, so there's nothing really to say about what the Turkish contingent did because they really didn't do anything. Um, but it is an interesting kind of what if. And when you read the accounts of not only their commander, uh, General Vivian, but also many of the uh, Anglo-Indian officers who wrote memoirs after this, they all mention this idea that they were, they got along very well with their troops, they followed orders, there wasn't any issue of you know, or cultural conflict. And they believed that they could have used uh, this army to their benefit. A second um, case of British officers leading Ottoman troops can be found in what was called the Osmanli Irregular Cavalry. Uh, another group who, while uh, not at all serving in the war, had a much more colorful history to discuss. Um, this is a picture of something called a Bashi Bozluk, which uh, was an Ottoman soldier, uh, an irregular cavalry member who his actual military um, designation is a little bit vague, but basically they were irregular soldiers uh, recruited from all across the empire. Albanians, Kurds, and Arabs, but oftentimes from tribal centers. And they would serve in the Ottoman army, sometimes as scouts, but sometimes as just additional troops. However, they were notorious for their lack of discipline and the fact that they were often um, more trouble than they were worth. Uh, Basi Vosluk literally translate as crazy headed. Um, and these soldiers, they, they wore their own clothes, they didn't wear uniforms, they fought in their own style, and most of their motivation for campaign was, was raiding deep. So um, the Ottomans, as much as they used them, oftentimes found themselves fighting against them. Now, the British um, under, just want to get the name wrong. Oh, what's your first name, Gibson? Um, under William Ferguson Beetson, uh, another uh, Anglo-Indian officer, uh, the British believed they could raise an effective group of Ottoman irregulars and use them like the famous Russian Cossacks. And Beetson uh, himself was uh, particularly confident that he would be able to command Ottoman irregular troops because in India he had commanded irregular troops in Hyderabad. Now, and in fact, during this time period, you can find um, 
various British officers who have written manuals about commanding irregular Indian troops. And these irregular Indian troops are called sildars. Sildar meaning bearers of arms in Persian. Um, but what's but the difference was in India, sildars came from the Muslim elite. They were the elite who could afford horses and arms. Whereas Bashi Bosluts in the Ottoman Empire came from oftentimes the lowest ranks of society, at least from the Ottoman perspective. However, um, Beetson was granted permission to raise a force of Bashi Bosluts and uh, established a unit which was called Beetson's Horse. Um, Beetson is a very interesting character. He was actually involved in the charge of the Light Brigade during the Crimean War, and um, he was eternally bitter that he did not receive rec a recognition for this obviously um, heroic, if not foolhardy, charge. So, Beetson likewise found uh, Ottoman, found Anglo Indian officers who spread across the Ottoman Empire and recruited irregulars. They went to Albania, they went to, uh, to, to Syria, and in each place they were given a mission to raise and then ride across the empire with anywhere from 500 to 1,000 Bashi Bazooks, which they raised, and they all converged uh, on a camp in the Dardanelles. Now, very, very quickly, uh, this camp in the Dardanelles began running into conflict with the locals. Uh, the Ottoman locals, as well as the Levantine families, uh, such as uh, Frederick William Calvert, uh, who had two farms nearby, were um, quite concerned about this encampment of somewhere close to 4,000 Bashi Bozuks on their doorstep. Um, and very quickly, uh, various events started taking place. Uh, Bashi Bazooks would go into town, they would get drunk, break out, people would be injured, people would be killed. Uh, Beetson also uh, deputized his Bashi Bazooks to guard uh, the surrounding areas, and they came into conflict with French soldiers who were accused of uh, raiding uh, local vineyards. So, Within a short period of time, everyone in the area was calling for the removal of these Bashi Bazooks. And on September 26, 1855, uh, the camp at the Dardanelles was awakened to find themselves surrounded by Ottoman regular forces, some 400 regular Ottoman soldiers with supporting artillery, along with uh, French troops and British gunboats, all prepared uh, to attack the camp. Um, a few more photos of Bashi uh, In the end, there was no battle, and um, in the end, command was, um, was, was uh, Beetson's command was replaced by General Smith from the Turkish contingent who came, came down to take command. During, uh, during the shift in command, there was a petition circulated from the Bashi Bazooks themselves. Uh, this is the um, version of the archives, but uh, what it said in effect is they uh, rejected the uh, replacement of uh, Beetson by this new commander and they, were, they asked that they be allowed to continue under their own officers and under their own uh, national dress. They were very worried about becoming, being turned into regular Ottoman soldiers. Um, and there was, there are three or four different versions of this petition, all written in English, but uh, again, signed, as you can see here, by uh, different captains of various Bashi Bozuk res uh, regiments. Now, it's an interesting question about who actually uh, drew up uh, these petitions. 
Um, there is some speculation that the Bashevzus themselves did not um, did not on their own initiative write these, but rather they were encouraged by their uh, Ottoman officers. And um, and there is a long soap opera drama, which I won't get into now, but I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, which involved uh, accusing mutiny, uh, which resulted in um, years of legal troubles and trials for Beetson. Um, however, when we read uh, this petition, there are some concerns here that could have come from the Bashi Bishops themselves. Uh, it's interesting that they talk about preserving their national dress and their fear of becoming regulars. One of the advantages of being a Bashi Bazuk was uh, in a battle, if the battle was going poorly, it was very easily to, easy to flee. Not only obviously that because you were on horseback, but also again, because you were not in uniform. So staying in your national dress allowed you to very quickly remove yourself from a dangerous situation and flee. So it is understandable that these Bashi, Bashi Bazuk officers uh, may have indeed been concerned that they would be merged with the Turkish contingent and turned into regulars. <clears throat> it is also interesting that um, Beetson and his officers were very defensive about their Bashi Bazuk troops. They blamed the French, they blamed um, the local Ottoman authorities, they blamed uh, Stratford in Istanbul, uh, they blamed everyone but their own troops. <clears throat> and they actually made a very interesting argument, which, which was basically, our troops are no more violent or dangerous than any other troops. Yes, they commit the occasional crime, but so do troops from every army. And they explicitly say that had these been regular British troops or French troops, that similar crimes would have taken place. <clears throat> and that the problem with the, uh, with and this attempt to train and organize um, these Ottoman Bashar groups was not the men themselves, but their name, their reputation, which preceded them. <clears throat> After the end of um, the Crimean War and as uh, before the Beetson's horse, like the Turkish contingent, uh, took no part in the actual fighting of the Crimean War. Both groups were disbanded. It is unknown what happened to the Ottoman regulars who served in the Turkish contingent or the Bashi Bozluks, but the um, British officers were all awarded Ottoman medals, and a few of them actually continued in Ottoman service. Um, one of them in particular was an Irishman named Eugene O'Reilly. Uh, O'Reilly was an interesting character because he actually first appeared during 1848, um, during the many failed revolutions of that period, as an Irish revolutionary. However, he must have been from high class and had good political connections because rather than being thrown in prison, he was commissioned um, to travel across Europe uh, raising troops for the British during the Crimean War. Uh, he ended up being one of the members of Beetson's Horse, and he successfully was able to uh, raise troops uh, from Syria and ride with them across the empire without incident. After the Crimean War, uh, he was given the name Hassan Bey uh, and served um, in the late 1850s and early 1860s uh, in Lebanon on the staff of Farad Pasha. Um, there are multiple accounts by uh, British officers who run into him in Mount Lebanon, um, including the Prince of Wales who uh, visited Syria in 1862 uh, to in, and reported that O'Reilly had been put in, in charge of the Ottoman gendarmes in Syria. Um, the Prince of Wales wrote, uh, Colonel O'Reilly, known as Hassan Bey, is an Irishman in Turkish service, a pleasant and uh, considerate fellow. After 1862, his uh, life is hard to follow. 
Uh, according to French sources, uh, he was recalled to Istanbul in 1863, uh, involving a plot against Ottoman authorities in Syria. Uh, however, between 1860 and 1866, there's numerous letters between him and uh, officials in the War Department, uh, which contradict this. But at some point um, in around 1868, he was involved in an incident uh, with Prince Halim, who was the um, was one the last remaining living sons of Mehmet Ali um, in Kevdet of Egypt. And again, the details are, were murky then and are murky now, but he was somehow involved in a plot with this prince to either um, promote his power within Egypt or in Syria, and he was dismissed from Ottoman service. O'Reilly died in 1874 at the age 48, uh, fighting in Morocco uh, in his, quote, on a mission for some English capitalists. Uh, an obituary in the Irishman noted that he was one of the 1848 revolutionaries, but he left his Irish brothers behind to pursue a career with the British and Ottomans. And that, in other words, they should only celebrate his life between 1848 and 1850. Now, Going back to um, our earlier discussion of how to become a, a officer in the Ottoman army, um, on first glance, O'Reilly appears a little bit like a renegade, a failed revolutionary who ended up in Ottoman service and uh, was, in fact, on the run from uh, the British government. But this, again, is not at all the case. He was clearly connected to British authorities. Uh, and although he took the name Hassan Bey, there's no evidence that he ever converted or really adopted an Ottoman lifestyle. It was clear that he was kept on for his military skill uh, and acumen, uh, but that ultimately his loyalty uh, was with the British Empire. During the interwar period between the Crimean and uh, Russo-Ottoman War of 1877, 1878, um, a number of individuals entered Ottoman service. Um, in particular, two very famous sailors, Henry Felix Wood and Charles Hobart Hampton. Uh, they are popularly known as Woods Pasha and Hobart Pasha. Um, on the 14th of July, 1869, the Ottoman foreign minister, Mehmet Ali Pasha, asked Harry Eli Henry Elliott, the British ambassador to the port, to hire uh, Henry Felix Wood. And in turn, um, Harry Elliott asked the British uh, state for permission for the Ottomans to hire him. The uh, British had no objective, had no um, no problem with Woods entering Ottoman service. And uh, in 1869, Woods signed a contract with the Ottoman state to train cadets in service of the Ottoman Navy. At the time, there are four other um, unnamed uh, British naval officers who are reported to have joined the um, the Ottoman Navy at the same time. However, with the exception of Hobart Pasha, who came a little bit later, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't seem that any of these other officers stayed in the Ottoman Empire. I will talk about um, Woods Pasha a little bit later, but uh, from 1869 um, um, until his death in, 1820, in 1929, he spent the rest of his life in Istanbul except for the brief period of World War I, where he left Istanbul, but he returned to Istanbul in, uh, in, 18, sorry, in 1918 um, with the armistice. Um, but one of the most interesting British officers to come to the Ottoman Empire in this period uh, was a man named Valen Valentin Baker. Um, Valentin Baker was a um, rising star of the British military. He was a colonel in the 10th Royal Hussars and was personal friends with the regiment's uh, patron, the Prince of Wales. 
1875, he published an account of his travels in Central Asia, complete with strategic re recommendations for the defense of India against Russian encroachment, a, very much a classic great game uh, manuscript. Uh, however, uh, on May 17, 1878, um, Baker assaulted a young woman on a train in Britain. Um, again, the, the details of the assault and trial um, are a melodrama in themselves, um, but it certainly seems clear that uh, Baker Pasha attempted to, to assault this young woman and due to her high social class, the uh, trial was the, the scandal of the day. Um, and in fact, uh, an American, uh, a well-known American, Mark Twain, um, wrote of the trial that had such um, an event taken place in the American South, we would have immediately strung up and hung the offender. However, due to his um, political connections, uh, Baker Pasha uh, was not convicted, um, but he was kicked out of the British Army, uh, despite the protests of the Prince of Wales, uh, apparently at the insistence of Queen Victoria, who was quite um, upset by this incident. Um, with his career over, the Duke of Cambridge uh, recommended uh, Baker to the Ottoman ambassador in London. And in 1876, the Minister of For uh, Foreign Affairs uh, noted in his correspondence back to the Ottoman court that Colonel Baker was the younger Baker, was the younger brother of Baker Pasha, so now it's two Baker Pashas. His older brother was Samuel White Baker, who was at the time operating under Imperial Fairman, um, suppressing the slave trade in Egypt. The Ottomans were impressed with Baker's career and decided to hire him to help train their gendarme. Now, on the one hand, this again kind of sounds like a classic renegade tale a British officer who uh, can no longer seek service in his own country and is forced to find a new country to make home. But again, like O'Reilly and many others, this is really not the case. While Baker Pasha may have been persona granata with Queen Victoria and may have uh, been unable to continue his career within the British military, he still uh, maintained close connections to the British uh, military and political elite. And while serving in the Ottoman Empire, routinely corresponded and passed on maps and intelligence about uh, the British, uh, sorry, about the Ottoman army uh, to his British friends and superiors. Now, with the outbreak of the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877, um, Baker Pasha believed that he would be put in command of upwards of 50,000 Ottoman troops and given the defense um, of Istanbul. Um, he, in fact, in a letter to um, Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, wrote that uh, he expected this command uh, any day and uh, wished to coordinate a combined Ottoman-British uh, response, which would involve him in command of these Ottoman troops, supported by a British naval uh, expedition, uh, which would land in support of the Ottomans uh, against the Russians. However, again, like in the case of the um, of the Turkish contingent, uh, this discussion of supporting the Ottomans very much had a um, overt imperial tone. That again, with he Baker Pasha in command of this new Turkish contingent of fifty thousand men and with support of the British Navy, that this would very much increase uh, British influence within the Ottoman Empire. Um, not surprisingly, uh, the, the British government was excited by this plan. However, Disraeli uh, was um, not long after replaced as the uh, British government changed and Gladstone became the new prime minister. Um, and this plan was abandoned as Gladstone uh, at this point um, rejected any direct support of the Ottomans during the war. It is also important to note that 
there is no uh, evidence that the Ottomans ever seriously considered putting Baker in charge of 50,000 Ottoman troops. He was always kept on um, as a staff officer within the uh, Ottoman military, um, but there is never, there's never any evidence that they planned to give him a direct command of Ottoman troops. And uh, just as the British uh, may have been salivating at the idea of what influence um, a British officer commanding uh, Ottoman troops might have had, I am sure the Ottomans were equally aware of the danger of giving a loyal uh, British officer command of a majority of their forces. Uh, I should actually hold on. Um, shortly after the Russo-Turkish War, uh, Baker Pasha left Ottoman service, going to uh, what had recently become British uh, Egypt, uh, serving there, um, and likewise again serving British imperial interests in Egypt, and in no way serving in the Ottoman agenda in Egypt. But one of his lasting legacies was to recruit other. Um, British officers to join and train the Ottoman Jamdar. And one of them um, we know as Blunt Pasha. Um, in memoirs of this period uh, from British travelers, the two names that are always mentioned together are Blunt Pasha and Woods Pasha. If you can kind of notice this guy with the, the fez, um, not a very good picture, but that is Blunt Pasha with uh, what we assume is our cadets in the back, his cadets in the background. Um, every account from this period, British tra travelers talk about um, both Blunt and Wood Pasha's uh, involvement in uh, their training of, um, of either the Ottoman Navy or Ottoman Army. Um, in uh, 1893, Blunt Pasha was made a general. A few years later, he was awarded by um, the Ottoman state. Uh, he died in Istanbul in 1909 at the age 74 of a stroke and was given a um, full Ottoman military funeral. These, um, these British officers who served the Ottoman state, again, are, I would say, rather thoroughly modern. They faithfully serve the Ottomans. Uh, they faithfully wrote uh, in defense of the Ottomans. Uh, Woods Pasha wrote a number of uh, defenses against uh, Ottoman massacres of Armenians in the 1890s. And while uh, obviously uh, the judgment of history is against Woods Pasha in this regard, it is clear that uh, he was personal friends with uh, Abdul Hamid II and was loyal to the Ottoman state. Um, he survived the Young Turk Revolution in 1908 and continued to be uh, a key member training the uh, Ottoman Navy. And again, he only left um, Istanbul in 1914 with the outbreak of World War I. Um, and as soon as the war was over in 1918, he returned. Um, he, uh, well, it is clear he was married to a, I don't know, Greek Levantine woman. Uh, it is clear his son married into the Vital family. Um, but one of the uh, issues dealing with um, memoirs of uh, British officers from this era is that they, while they will expound pages of detail on engineering feats or military maneuvers or old friends they met, there is a very strong male gauge, gaze and they will never talk about their wives, their children, their home life. What glimpses we get into the, um, the personal lives of these men uh, will only come from um, oftentimes other men who remark, oh, I, I spent the weekend at Wood Pasha's house and we had, you know, a great time and I met his wife and his son. And, you know, and his son is married to, a, you know, a daughter of the Wittal family. I mean, very, very um, vague information. 
Um, you know, these accounts are full of vivid descriptions of, you know, erotic oriental women who, you know, they clap, they, um, they glance from a balcony somewhere. Um, during the Russo-Turkish War, there are long accounts about meeting, you know, uh, Russian princesses. But again, literally not a sentence written about their own, you know, wives or, um, or children. Um, and this is definitely a, a disadvantage of trying to do Ottoman social history with the accounts of military officers. Um, but again, in conclusion, uh, this period shows us how uh, there was, to try to maybe coin a new phrase, a, another identity, call it an imperial identity. One which saw men culturally and politically, religiously loyal to one empire, in this case, the British Empire, while faithfully serving another empire. And um, these men, in every sense of the word, were imperialists, with no modern negative connotation put on that. They were faithful servants of the British Empire who saw that um, the objectives and goals of the British Empire could be served by serving in this case, the Ottoman Empire. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's really been um, a pleasure speaking to you. I have um, so many deal, uh, details and juicy stories. I'm happy to um, discuss if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Excellent, Joshua. Thank you so much for fascinating talk. Um, uh, so um, really appreciate that. Um, so probably half an hour for questions, comments. Um, does anyone have a burning question they'd like to lead off with? Um, Stephen. Yep, Stephen Boysmith. Thank you. Um, can I come in with two or three things? Firstly, on Beetson and the Bashi Bazooks, and I should declare my interest. I've written about James Henry Skeen, who was the consul that Stratford Canning sent to the Dardanelles when trouble started to brew up and who that secretly back to Canning was a key figure in that frightful debate. Um, uh, but I would be interested in your uh, comments on the role of Canning in the establishment of the Bashi Bazooks and whether that was a one-off because it was Canning who was a domineering personality and the usual circumstances of the Crimean War, or whether politicians and diplomats had a role in all this as well. If I, I may I sort of put three points in, unconnected. Uh, second, Hobart Pasha, I have the impression, but I may be wrong, that he was a key naval figure in the blockade of Crete, 1866 to 68, 69, and the blockade was a key element in the um, uh, in the Turkish uh, government being able to subdue the, the rising, albeit that they came to a compromise in the organ and so on. If that's the case, then Hobart Pasha was a very important figure in the future of Crete because it would have come out differently in 1869, and then the subsequent decades might also have. Um, have been different. And thirdly, if you don't mind me banging it in, then I'll shut up. On, on Woods Pasha in Spanyan, he had quite a lot of criticism uh, of the Turkish Navy. I mean, he was working in it. Man, certainly when he was in Crete in Suda Bay, training people, he was very critical about the hopeless state of the ships the inefficiency of the crews, the fact that the crews were taken off to go and build the, the arsenal instead of uh, uh, getting ship shape, so to speak. So, um, and I wonder whether Woods in doing that was unusual or whether some of these other officers, particularly when they published in English later on in their lives, were equally blunt because he was pretty blunt. I'll, I'll shut up there. Uh, those are all great questions. Um, so, um, first, yes, um, there are Sikhs, um, 
you know, as you may know, was later involved in a, I guess we call it a defamation suit against Beetson after the war. Yeah. Um, Beetson accused him of accusing Beetson of, of fomenting mutiny. Um, so, but the question is, you know, why, why is these logical suits and whose idea was this? Um, so, again, I think part of it had to do with the fact that the British were just desperate for soldiers. They had so few and they wanted to have, um, you know, fighting forces for the war. Um, but, and apparently Beetson himself uh, at the very beginning of the war suggested this idea to the Ottomans and they said, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, but apparently what happened is the um, Ottomans gave gave the right to raise a regiment, which was called the Sapahis Orient. Sapahi is the name for the old um, Ottoman um, cavalry. And apparently, again, the, uh, the French under a uh, French Algerian officer who likewise had lots of experience with irregular forces in Algeria, raised this large force. And again, the idea was that they were gonna be a, you know, a counterweight to the Russian Cossacks. Uh, however, they likewise, wherever they went, served, pillaged, you know, raped, murdered. Uh, but most importantly, in their very first military engagement, uh, um, they, they uh, charged them, and all of these uh, French, um, you know, uh, irregulars immediately fled, and their commander was killed. <laughs> so uh, it obviously, obviously didn't work out very well for the French. But apparently, because the Ottomans had given the French the right to raise this regiment, the British then came back and said, oh, well, if the French can do it, then sh so should we. Um, so actually, you know, uh, two or three different attempts before the, the final iteration of Beetson's horse actually happened. Um, in, um, in 1854, there's actually an appeal published um, in a number of uh, London newspaper is called an appeal from a Bashi Bozluk, and again, it's written supposedly by an Ottoman Bashi Bozluk who just really wants to serve with the British and requests that you know the British government and people provide funds and clothing so that you know we can serve under the British. Again, probably penned by Beetson or you know someone close to him. You know, I don't think that Strafford King or Sykes had to become enemies of Beetson. I think Beetson really kind of had a paranoid streak. You know, he he blames everyone, right? It's the Jews' fault. It's the Armenians' fault. It's the French's fault. Like, you know, all, all, everyone's conspiring against me to, to slander the good name of my troops and to, you know, kind of personally attack me. So I think he made, um, I think he made enemies where he really didn't need to. I don't know if that kind of answers your first question. No, indeed, yes, yes. Um, yes. Well, Sorry. I would just add that Skeen was the author of the wholly fraudulent book on the Crimean War. Yes. Uh, and, which is part of what I've written about, but he's one of the great um, lies of history as far as I'm concerned. So, that, you know, what I find really interesting about Skeen's is that um, the reports that he wrote during the Crimean War um, you know, to to Caning, they seem they seem truthful and accurate. But it's later on that yeah, he writes this this memoir. Again, you know, everyone was writing their personal account of this or that. I mean, you know, men who like showed up at a stall bowl for three days and like saw some troops march by would write down, oh, I was involved. You know, like every you know, it was kind of the I don't know what the modern equivalent of this is. Everyone was trying to get a Netflix show or become famous as an influencer or something. You know, it's like everyone was trying to have their their literary star. Um, so I do wonder if that was part of the motivation, right? Like that was sir, he, you know, he seemed to do a pretty good job, you know, filing reports, but then once, you know, he was on his own, yeah, he wrote this very fraudulent account. But yeah, it'd be interesting to to, to learn what you discovered about that. Um, you're right, Hobart Pasha is a, a critical. Uh, figure, I largely left him out of my thesis because his memoir is also kind of unreliable. Um, and 
it was it was harder to pin down how he entered Ottoman service. Um, yeah, he was involved with some scandals in England, um, but again, how exactly he entered Ottoman service, I, I wasn't able to nail down. With you know, with Woods Pasha and you know Baker and Blunt and, and many others, I was able to find again sources in both the British and the Ottoman archives that kind of confirmed you know, how they were introduced, their connections, their contracts. And I wasn't able to find that with Hobart. And that probably exists. It's probably just my fault that I never found it. But yeah, I agree. He's, he's definitely a major figure in the Ottoman uh, Navy. Um, and yeah, his blockade of Crete was search- certainly a uh, um, Woods Woods' criticism of the Ottoman Navy, I think that's actually very common. Um, you get a lot of people who kind of, a lot of writers who have this line where they really heavily criticize the Ottoman officialdom and bureaucracy, right? They're corrupt, they're self-serving, they're, you know, they're stealing the soldiers' pay, um, you know, they're, um, you know, they're, it's not meritocratic, the, the people are completely unqualified. And then they say, on the other hand, the everyday soldiers, right? The everyday sailors, they're magnificent, they're amazing. And if only they had a more competent government. But I also feel like that is a refrain that you find everywhere, right? That the, the bureaucrats are corrupt, the politicians don't know what they're doing, and but the people on the ground, if we just had the right resources, we could do it. Um, so no, I don't think that Wood's criticism is particularly unique. You, you find that in, in a lot of places. But I guess you have to remember he's writing for a British audience. So I don't think that, you know, anyone in um, in Istanbul is gonna be offended or even wrote. Um, although it's interesting, I think at the very last, very last page of, of Spun Yarn, he does say this like, I have, you know, lots of great details to tell you about not going to because they'd be too controversial, <laughs> you know? So it would be interesting, I get a lot of, Clearly, they, you know, did guard his words, but I don't think he was worried about criticizing the Ottoman bureaucracy. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, if, Joshua, if I can ask something, please. So can, can you put the British influence um, and advisors into context? I mean, were there other nations that provided as many uh, military advisors. So obviously in the Ottoman context, the other nation to think about is first Prussia and then Germany. And there were certainly um, Prussian military advisors in the 1820s and 30s. Um, and then certainly, you know, closer to the outbreak of World War One, there are, um, you know, many more German advisors. However, one recurring um, refrain I found among Again, British writers writing in, you know, the the late 1890s, the early 10s, is they say oh, everyone in England is talking about all the German officers here, but actually, there's really not that many. Now, again, I think they have a perspective, which is not that anyone obviously saw the exact outbreak of World War One, but everyone you know saw a potential great power conflict coming. And I think there were a lot of, again, um, <clears throat> you know, pro-Ottoman, uh, you know, it's a pro-Ottoman camp within the British Empire that, again, wanted to promote, hey, the Ottomans are still our friend. You know, they haven't gone over completely to the Germans. You know, we shouldn't abandon them. So it's hard to know. Um, the, uh, oh, shoot, let's see the author. There's a great book, The Ottoman Road to War, where they kind of talk about you know, um, why the Ottomans chose the Germans and not, um, you know, basically the English at the outbreak of the war. But, um, you know, otherwise there's definitely a few, you know, again, British, sorry, a French who come um, as trainers. Um, but again, the, the, the officers who seem to have the longest connection were these, um, were these British officers. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I say someone asked a question about um, 
Can you say a few words about Bashi's Bozluks as you use the name irregular soldiers, fighters interchangeably? <clears throat> um, um, and uh, I almost, I mean, I wanted really to actually write a, a thesis about Bashi Bozluks because I, I really think they're interesting. Um, so before the Bashi Bozluks, there were uh, Delis, which were again, kind of these irregular scouts. Um, Bashi Bozluk is really kind of a catch-all term because there were oftentimes distinct groups within the empire. So there were Albanian irregulars who got called Bashi Bozluk. There were Kurdish irregulars who got, got called Bozluks. But then later, the same Kurdish irregulars that we would identify as Bashi Bozluks, like in the 1890s, they become the Hamidia regiments. But again, that term and Bashi Bozluk is oftentimes used interchangeably. One of the really big groups, especially during the um, Russo-Turkish War, were actually uh, Karsatian Bashi Bozluks. They had fled the, um, the Russian Empire and they had been resettled in the Ottoman Empire. And again, they still had a largely, you know, kind of, uh, you know, tribal structure. And there's lots of Karsatian Bashi Bozluks who likewise don't seem particularly loyal to the Ottoman army, do a lot of pillaging. Um, so yeah, I mean, in the 19th century, this term really gets used interchangeably. If, if it's an irregular soldier, it's back, they're a Bashi Bozluk. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from me, if I may, um, I just sort of struck, did, it was, did the Turk, did the Osman military have a lack of confidence in having all these advisors? Was that a, is this an indication of that? Or was it just, they knew they needed to bring in external expertise? So I think, especially in the Crimean War, and, um, and something that Baker Pasha is, I think part of taking on, like during the war, part of taking on advisors is trying to curry political favor with the British. And I think, you know, especially in the case of Baker Pasha and some of the other um, British generals who they take on during the war, the Russo-Turkish, Russo-Ottoman War, and they put on their general staffs, I think it's much more about trying to make political connections that will gain them support than they desperately need advisors. Um, obviously, they did need military advisors trying to modernize their army um, and navy. Um, but I think a lot of it was about, yeah, having political connections to the British, um, especially, and obviously later the Germans. Uh, you know, and they, there's also plenty of what you might call traditional European um, officers, you know, German, um, Hungarian, um, you know, officers who were trained in, you know, modern warfare, who due to political circumstances kind of took this more traditional renegade approach where they enlisted, they converted, um, um, you know, actually uh, the famous Turkish poet uh, Nazim Hikmet, his, uh, his great, great grandfather was a, a German military officer who came over and, and converted um, and you know, died, you know, suppressing a revolt in Montenegro, I think. Um, I think you know, especially after 1848, for example, there's just tons of um, Hungarian officers, you know, who have just uh, obviously lost their action uh, against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, end up in the Ottoman Empire. Um, some of them, you know, stay there for a couple of years. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stories about how they would take on Turkish names and they would convert, but they would postpone the circumcision ceremony. And, you know, some of those men, they stayed, and I don't actually know if they got circumcised, but one might assume so, because they spent the rest of their life there. They, you know, they really, again, became Ottoman. But others, you know, they were there for a couple of years, they served in a few campaigns, and they moved on to another country. Hmm. Yes, sir. well, um, my great-grandfather was Polish and fought, um, you know, for the Ottoman side against the Russians. So any Russian campaign, you know, he was there um, for you know, 
you know, traditional reasons. Yeah, there's an interesting story. Uh, again, uh, another uh, British wanderer who ends up in a stall in 1977. He gets together a few other people, and, you know, they want to fight. And so they, they, again, none of them are Polish, but they all declare a Polish legion because they know that the Ottomans have a sympathy for the Poles and that the Poles are always happy to fight the Russians. So in this endeavor to like raise their own regiment, they call it the Polish Legion and try to start recruiting, even though again, none of them were actually Polish. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, thank you very much. Now, any, any last questions or comments? Um, I've got one sort of question to throw out. I mean, do any of the audience have any connections to any of the people mentioned by Joshua? Um, you know, you can say now, but if not, you know, do write in and we'd be happy to connect you uh, to him um, if you have any records. Particularly interested to note the lack of information about the family. So if we can find links to some of that personal information, um, that, that would be excellent. We'd be very to help if we can. Um, so unless there are any last comments or questions can i just say thank you very much joshua really appreciate your talk fascinating and for enduring the heat um, uh, in in delivering it uh, thank you to our audience for participating um, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon thank you very much thank you bye bye